evening. It's great to have you back for the third lecture tonight and um, hope that you will enjoy hearing more about the history of Israel. And as you will see from your notes and also on the screen, this is the topic for the evening. I have had a terrible church history lecturer. Now, church history does not cover biblical history. Bible history is what we pick up in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And by the end of the first century AD, that's where Bible history ends. From that point on, we start talking about church history. It goes back into the Old and the New Testament, of course, because that's foundational. Um, but specifically, when you study theology, then you do church history, which covers uh, the period from uh, the early church all the way up to modern church history, and um, 2,000 years of that. I had a very terrible and boring church uh, history lecturer, and we always joked and said, we're going to record him and then play it while we can't sleep, and then that will put us to sleep. Uh, and, and I hope that tonight I won't really put you to sleep. I hope that you will be alive and well and enjoy this journey as we quickly go through uh, the Old Testament and then also the New Testament history. And, the, and on the New Testament, I'm just going to briefly cover um, the section that we have in the New Testament, but primarily focus on the Old Testament because it really provides us with so much of the background of what we know in terms of the New Testament, the unfolding of the Christian church, and then where we are today. It goes all the way back to God's calling of Abraham. In fact, it goes back to God creating the universe. When we look at uh, what I want to share with you tonight, comes from Acts chapter 7. Um, just a few thoughts from there. I can't read it all, but Stephen is one of the people appointed to look after the widows in Acts chapter 6. Stephen shows great ability in speaking and arguing with the people in the synagogue and in the temple and so on. And um, people, the Jews were not happy with him, so they uh, take him prisoner and they put him on a stand or um, in a court or whatever, maybe, at, uh, maybe at the, uh, in the temple itself or even at the Sanhedrin. And uh, he begins his defense by saying, then the high priest asked him in, in verse 1 of chapter 7, are these charges true? Because they are bringing all sorts of charges against Stephen that he is opposed to Judaism, opposed to God, opposed to the temple, etc., etc. And to this he, Stephen, replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. Now this is all I'm going to read from chapter 7 because if you, as you go on, Stephen actually gives the Sanhedrin, I mean a lay person is giving these learned people a lesson in history, uh, the Israelite history. And it proves a couple of things. It proves that history to them was important. It proves the fact that people even as lay people were thoroughly introduced to the history of Israel because it was foundational for them in terms of their belief. They all knew about the fact that God created the universe. They knew that God called Abraham to form the first, the forefather of the Israelites. They knew the story of the Exodus, the entrance into the land of Canaan. They knew about the kings as they came and as they have gone. And then Stephen then drew it even further. Um, in terms of the temple and right at the end of his message he blames the Israelites for not listening to God and not giving attention to God and he said here you are worshipping in a building and God cannot be contained in a building and then at that particular point he really gets very excited and he says you stiff-necked people in verse 51 with uncircumcised hearts and ears you are just like your fathers you always resist the Holy Spirit and, and, and it's really a lesson from history. And he says, if you, if you follow your own history, you will see how your forefathers, our forefathers, resisted God, resisted the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul picks up on that same theme in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He talks to the Corinthians about the Israelite history. And he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. Again, he reaches back into history. History is important. It lays a foundation. It's this, we are the product of history. 
Many of us love hearing about our family trees, for example. Where did you come from? Um, what was your surname or, or what's your family history? Uh, many of us feel like we need to be connected to our family roots somehow or the other. And it's no different. It wasn't different for these people. And so Paul uses that. But then in verse 6 he says, Now these things occurred as examples or an alternative translation as types. These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So essentially, both Stephen and Paul are saying, learn from history. And tonight as we do a bit of a historical lesson, uh, I trust that we will learn. Now, I'm going to share with you some of the dates and the events. And um, I'm, I'm doing that because I want to... Uh, lay a foundation in terms of our knowledge as the history of Israel unfolded. And when next time you read the Bible, hopefully, you will be able to make those historical connections and read the Bible in the context of history. One thing I need to share with you, I, for many years as I was growing up, I thought Israel was it. I mean, the Bible is about Israel. So I thought Israel was a massive big country with a massive big people group and, and, and that was all that there was in history somehow or the other. As I was growing up and especially as I started studying theology, uh, I was a little bit shocked. It was a bit of a, an awakening for me to discover that Israel is really was literally a tiny, tiny little bit of history, the world history. I mean, the, the Chinese um, empires and history and those things are not even mentioned in the Bible. And, and the, the empires that are mentioned, and I will introduce some of that to you tonight, like the Assyrians and the Babylonians and later on the Greeks and so on, and the Roman empires, uh, those things play an enormously important role in the history of Israel. But I didn't understand it just at a cursory reading of the Bible. And so what I'm going to try to do tonight is really to put the Bible in historical perspective with a very brief overview. Uh, you would have to read some more and wider if you, if you want to know more about the history uh, of, of Israel. So before we go any further, let's pray together and then I'll introduce the topic to you any further. Oh, Father, we thank you for an opportunity to come and learn. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that the Bible has proved itself over many years as your word to us. And I pray that as we learn more about the word, more about the context, more about the historical context of the Bible, that you would learn, that, that, that we would learn to follow you, and that we would learn from history. And Lord, that we would be open to be taught by your Holy Spirit as we learn from history the lessons that you want us to know. And then as we apply it to our own lives, lead us to make that application every day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Last week, we had a look at the biblical canon, the Bible canon. I hope that um, you have learned more about the fact that we can trust the Bible as reliable. We've looked at the Old Testament and how the Jews came to an understanding of the 39 books that entered into our biblical canon. I've introduced you to the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, uh, those extra-biblical books. And again, I hope that you will learn more about that as you go along um, and that I've, I've uh, triggered your cur curiosity maybe in, in uh, helping you to understand more about that. And uh, these are open books. They're there for you to study and to learn more about. But we also learn how both the Jews as well as the early Christian church came to an understanding of the, the necessity of a canon, in other words, the Word of God, the author authoritative Word of God, and then also the process that they followed in order to determine which of the books should be in both the Old as well as in the New Testament. So that's where we came from uh, last time. Um, against the background of the map of Israel, as you zoom out, you begin to realize, and I'll show you more maps uh, as we go along, but uh, as you zoom out, you, un you begin to understand how tiny Israel really is in terms of an entire world map. In fact, uh, Israel, the country of Israel today, modern Israel, is the size of the Kruger National Park, uh, virtually. So it's a very tiny little place in the Middle East, and in the whole world it disappears, almost. And it's, an, it's interesting to note how important that little uh, place became over history and still is till today. Now today, we are going to um, 
give our attention to the history and the background, as I said before. A uh, couple of questions that you may have. Uh, did these biblical characters really exist? And, and can we prove it? Uh, there's a lot that we can prove. There's also a lot that will remain a mystery for a long while. But it is also an unfolding science. It's an open science, in other words, not a closed one. And as more and more discoveries are made, so more and more we can bring uh, the pieces of facts together. If we believe that those characters and places that we uh, uh, read about and learn about in the Bible did exist, where, where do we confirm that? Uh, where, where do we find this kind of information? And the first part of my lecture tonight will actually focus on that. Where do we get the information? that we share around the history of Israel. And is it possible to date the Bible events with, with some measure of accuracy? I think the, those may be questions that you have. I hope that I'm going to answer some of those questions. I cannot answer every single question. And especially in the short lecture that, like this, we can only really scratch the surface. But once again, I hope that I can stimulate your curiosity and that you, can go, that you will go and learn more and read more about these things. Now, before we go any further, let's check in. Grab your notes, the back or the bottom or anywhere, doesn't really matter, and write down the names of the first 22 books of the Bible without looking at the notes and without looking at your Bible. If you have used abbreviations, you should be finished by now. Let me, let me just read them out for you. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy... Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. Last week I told you the first bit, the first part up to about the Psalms. It's not that difficult because there's some historical development. Now when we start hitting uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and so on. There's no historical line, and it becomes even more difficult to, to memorize them. But try and go through it every single week and, and memorize and, and discipline yourself in doing that. Some of the questions that you may have as you sit there tonight. The first one, when did Abraham actually live? What happened before Abraham? And what did the world look like back then? What do we know about Israel? What do we know about Israel and Egypt? and the Exodus, and what happened beyond the Exodus. Can we date these events? Where do the Bible books fit into the historical picture? Because there is a history of the whole world which can be fairly accurately described. And then how do we know that the history in the Bible is actually uh, accurate? Tonight I'm going to look at um, the calling of Abraham starting there. I'll make a, a brief few comments about what happened before Abraham. But we're really going to focus about Abraham, on Abraham, and from that point on, we're going to move through the early history. Uh, there are two sections in what we're going to look at. The first thing that I'll be sharing with you is the sources of our information. Where, where do we actually get this, this information? Um, apart from the Bible itself, and then we are going to do an overview, and when we get to that point, I'll use the whiteboard and try and take you along on a timeline uh, and I'm going to refer to that timeline again and again in the weeks to come. And especially as we get into the Old Testament section, then we're going to look at those dates. And some of those dates I will really encourage you to memorize and to put it in your memory somewhere because they are going to become very important. Next time your pastor preaches about some kind of event, the, the exile or the exodus or whatever, at least you will have some kind of historical framework uh, that you can use. In terms of our reading, Johnston, both Johnston and Harrison um, have sections about this. And then I want to refer once again to the Holman Bible Atlas. Uh, I have shared this with you in the first lecture, but this Bible Atlas actually has the timeline on top. So it doesn't matter where you open up this, uh, whatever page you open up, you'll find the timeline. And it's a very, very handy tool to have. Um, between this one and Biblica, you may decide to buy Biblica. Biblica does not have the timeline, but it is a wonderful, uh, great book for the price. They, they're in the same sort of price category. Um, but again, you are more than welcome uh, to come and have a look at that. But that's the kind of book uh, that will take you right through the history. Give you, it, it gives you some information about the background, the setting, uh, archaeological finds, uh, and so on and so on. 
And then if you have a Bible dictionary, such as the New Bible Dictionary, then topics like Israel, Church, Book of Acts, uh, Chronology of the Old Testament, the Chronology of the New Testament, and then also the topic Archaeology. All of those are discussed in your Bible Dictionary. So again, I encourage you to have a look at, at the, those, the extra reading. On the extra reading, I've had a couple of questions from people registered for the Certificate of Completion. Um, the 160 to 200 pages covers the whole module, not per week, but the whole module. And uh, please don't, well, you, you, you're more than welcome to read more than that, but in terms of the requirement, um, my purpose really is just to, to assist you in reading extra uh, work and um, not just to rely on the information that I'm giving you here in this course. In terms of our limitations, when, when we start talking about history, I think we all know that history is always written from a perspective. Now, even in recent history, um, I don't know how many of you have read a biography of Nelson Mandela, for example. Um, but do you know how many of those biographies have been published? Well, I don't, but I have seen plenty of them in the bookshops. And I can guarantee you it's the same story because it's the exact same man. We're not talking about a different person. It's the same man. But it seems like um, historians or different authors will have a particular emphasis or a particular angle that they want to highlight. Whether it is his, his, his attitude towards life or maybe he's the early part of his life, maybe his, his life in prison or then when he became president or whatever the angle is, you will have plenty of those autobiographies. And the same thing happens with history anywhere. I grew up in a white Afrikaans environment. And when I went to school, and those who are uh, sort of in my own age bracket will remember, that I, we had history books of South Africa. My children, when they went to school and they brought their history books back, they look very different from the history books that I had about the exact same South Africa, the history of South Africa. But it depends on who puts it together. So there's an angle, there's a view, uh, there's a point of departure. And so when we read the Bible, we need to understand there is a point of departure. We need to understand that the Bible uh, refers to events that happened, and we will talk about Abraham in a moment, but it, it dates back 4,000 years ago. Now, if people differ in their interpretation of uh, the history of Israel, uh, or maybe not Israel, maybe I need to use a more modern day example, uh, the history of South Africa. I guarantee you, you ask two people, you ask five different people to write the history of South Africa, you'll have five different perspectives. There are certain factual things that will remain the same. The date that Jan van Riebeek arrived in South Africa will remain exactly the same. Why he came and what he did to the country will, will depend on your angle, your view about what he accomplished in South Africa. And I can go on and on and, and use many such examples. Now, that's recent history. We're talking the last 400 years. Now, can you imagine we're trying to reconstruct history that happened 4,000 years ago and beyond? And it stops for us in terms of our uh, discussion tonight. It stops 2,000 years ago. So we're going to cover 2,000 years worth of history tonight uh, to some extent. And I'll come back to, to that uh, next week. But many years have passed since then. And much of the detailed information is simply lost for several reasons, not only because it's old, but also because there was a time when people didn't necessarily think, I'm going to write the history and leave it behind so that people 4,000 years somewhere in the future can read it. Uh, they didn't do research like that. They wrote history to share it with the people in their own community and own time. And much of that has gone lost uh, through many different ways. Um, either the stuff that they wrote on deteriorated and so it's no longer available or um, people simply didn't take care of it properly uh, or there was a destruction, some war or earthquake or whatever and it destroyed all the information that people put uh, together. However, having said all of that, starting almost on a negative note, we know a huge amount of information. We know a enough to make sure that the Bible, in my opinion, can be believed about the history that it uh, is writing. And then, we also need to be very clear, no science can verify faith. 
or statements of faith, faith or theological statements. Nobody can verify the Lord is my shepherd, which we believe David wrote. Uh, that's a, a faith statement. But science can verify whether David actually lived at a particular point in time. So we need to be very careful how we use the signs of, for example, archaeology, and I will introduce you to some of that uh, in just a moment. Talking about the sources of information, where do we get our information uh, about what happened in the past with the Bible? The main sources include, for, for Bible background, includes the Bible itself, of course, and the Bible is extremely detailed for a document that is as old as it is. We're not only relying on the Bible for the historical background information, and we need to understand that the Bible is primarily, was primarily written by people expressing their faith. Even when they wrote the history of Israel in Samuel or Kings or Chronicles, they wrote it because they believed in God and they saw God work in a particular way, and even the history for them pointed to the fact that God was involved in their lives. So it wasn't, the, the first purpose was not, I'm going to sit down and write history and going to research and do everything precisely. Uh, their, their purpose was to give glory to God and to write about God's involvement. So that's their perspective. It's interesting that we find the book of Luke, uh, the gospel of Luke, where he tells us at the beginning, I have done my research. Many others have, tr have put together the story of the gospel I'm looking at all of those, I'm using my own words, I'm looking at all of those, I'm going to put them all together, and in an orderly account, I'm going to write the gospel. So he tells us that he has done the research in order to get to the point where he did get. The, the second source of information uh, we, we get from archaeological discoveries, and it provides us with secondary support of the information found in the Bible. We have not uncovered more Bible books through archaeological means. It raises a very interesting point. Um, some of you may know that in the book of Colossians, Paul refers to a letter that he wrote to the Laodiceans. We do not have that letter. Now it raises an interesting point. Let's say through archaeological means, the, book of La the letter that he wrote to the Laodiceans is somehow discovered and is authenticated and everything else. Will we add it to our canon? Now that jumps back to last week's discussion. Will we add it to the canon or will we regard it or treat it as an extra biblical book now with a huge amount of value? I'm not going to give you the, the answer to that except to say my own personal belief around this is that we have enough in the Bible to teach us about God, to teach us about salvation. We do not need the book or the letter that Paul wrote to the Laodiceans. I don't think it will be discovered, but by some miracle it may be discovered somewhere along. But we lost it. We don't have that particular book. So archaeology helps us to discover more information. Primarily it provides us with background information. It tells us how people lived, um, how they communicated. It tells us some of the, the practices and cultural ideas that they shared back then. And when you then compare it with the Bible, it provides us with the background information that we are in a far better position to interpret some of the events that we have in the Bible. The third source of information is actually extra-biblical literature. It's related to archaeology uh, because most of these have been uncovered via archaeological means. People who have gone on a dig or someone who discovered something and then archaeologists and historians and other people just flock to the place and they start digging and uncovering and, uh, and so on. But they have discovered over years, uh, there are several major discoveries and I'm going to share just briefly with you later on some of those major discoveries. Not Bible books as such except for the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, which was a major find, but it wasn't through uh, archaeological means in the first place. It was really a, an accidental discovery uh, by a shepherd boy or a shepherd. But these books, um, and, and they're literally, in some cases, they've uncovered libraries full of sources. And when I say books, I mean some ancient manuscripts and so on, describing all sorts of different things, ranging from letters to receipts that people in business used and and some historical information uh, as well. And many of those discoveries have shed some light on names that we find in the Bible, 
um, some places and events, and we are now far better able to, uh, to determine what, what happened. Here is an example. We're talking about the Babylonian Chronicles, and uh, on the screen you will find uh, a coineform tablet mentioning the capture of Jerusalem in 597. Now, one of the dates I'm going to share with you a bit later on is that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587. So that's 10 years prior to the fall of Jerusalem. But here we have an extra biblical reference. It's not a biblical book. It's a Babylonian chronicle, but Babylonian historical source, if you wish, on a tablet, written on a tablet and then dried out. Uh, and this was discovered, and this actually mentions the uh, capturing or um, the, um, the war against Jerusalem. And here is a quote from Wikipedia. The Babylonian Chronicles are a series of tablets recording major events in Babylonian history. They are thus one of the first steps in the development of ancient historiography. The Babylonian Chronicles were written over a long, very long period of time, from the reign of Nebonassar up to the Parthian period by Babylonian astronomers or Chaldeans, uh, you will recognize that name, that name from some of the older Bible translations, who probably used the astronom astronomical diaries as their source. Almost all of the tablets are currently in the possession of the British Museum. And so if you go to London or to Britain, you, you can actually go and view them. You will never be able to access them, uh, but you can go and, and view them. The Bible is history. Um, I've said some of these things before, but let me just reiterate. The Bible is not intended in the first instance as, a histori as an historical book. It is intended as a faith expression. It is expressing our belief in God. In the process, it, it tells history. Like the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the story of the early church. But why do we need to know the story of the early church? Because this is the way Jesus worked. Because he died and the disciples went on a mission, they established the early church. And so it's a statement of faith. And then Bible authors describe the acts of God as he revealed himself to mankind. It is in and through history that God revealed himself. Obviously he did so through creation. But as the human history unfolds, so God revealed himself to them. The Bible looks at history through the eyes of God, uh, and it looks as, uh, as at Israel, that is the eyes of faith. As Israel, and that's particularly in the Old Testament, as Israel experienced God, they gave expression to their faith, both in the historical books, but primarily um, the books of the wisdom literature, I, I always call the, the worship material of Israel, because the Psalms and the Proverbs and those give expression to their faith in a, in a different kind of way to that of history. However, Having said all of that, I, I, I firmly believe that the events mentioned in the Bible actually did take place. So we're talking history. We're not just talking about um, stories that people made up. I told you before that the historical um, or the history of the Bible is an open science because uh, it's an ongoing process as people uh, discover more and more information about the ancient world. Now, just a few words about uh, the signs of archaeology. The word archaeology, also spelt uh, without the A, you can add the A or without it. I've seen it different uh, both ways. It comes from two Greek words. The first one is archaios, which means origin or beginning or ancient, and logos, which is word or study. Um, and, and we will, we will uh, find that logos, uh, ology, you will find it in, in most of the studies uh, that you do even at university. So archaeology means the study of the ancient things. According to Wikipedia, this is a science that studies human cultures through the recovery, documentation, analysis, and interpretation of material remains and environmental data. It is therefore the science of digging, literally and figuratively, in the past. And so th these are people, and, and it's done everywhere. It's not, just, it's not limited to the Bible. Uh, it is done right here in South Africa. Um, the University of the Witwatersrand Wits offers um, a whole degree. You can do your doctorate in archaeology and go on digs around South Africa. Um, if you're interested in biblical archaeology, um, then there are universities more specifically in the U.S. and in Israel where they offer that as a training. And those people go on the, they call them a dig, they go on digs, where they go and, and, and uncover uh, old materials that they find. Some of the archaeological evidence 
there was a time when this was not a properly developed science. I mean, people discovered stuff, but they didn't necessarily always realize the importance of that. And so many of the artifacts have gone missing for us, unfortunately. Um, but um, in the early days, when people started discovering and realized how important this is, you just had people flock to a particular area. Like, let, let's limit ourselves to Israel. Uh, there would be some discovery and someone would make an announcement about the discovery about a site in Israel and people would just flock there, all sorts of people, some who would literally want to loot the finds and take them and, and run off with them and try and sell them to museums because of the value of those things. And even those who at the beginning professed to be, um, years ago, to be archaeologists didn't understand the signs that well, so they did a lot of damage. Uh, one of the things that I will share with you a bit later on is when, when um, a city was destroyed, uh, it may rest for a little while, like 100 years or 50 years or whatever, and then new people would come and they build again, and they built on top of the old city. For good reasons, sometimes because water is available or because they knew there's an ancient city there. And, and that may happen several different times. Eventually it forms what they call a tell, it forms a hill. Uh, and underneath, you have layers of civilization. And so initially, some people would just come, come and start digging and, and just cut down the layers. Now, once a layer is removed, it's removed. You can never, you can never reconstruct that. And so archaeologists had to learn over the years to, to do this in a much better way. So rather than just take a layer off nowadays, they actually rather dig in uh, through what you may call a tunnel or a... Uh, a, a, some kind of a square or whatever the case might be. As the science has made major strides um, in the last hundred years or so uh, and is used all over the world in many different um, disciplines. Biblical archaeology concerns itself mainly with the Middle East and then specifically for our purposes we, we're focusing on Palestine uh, because that's where most of the Bible events uh, took place. What archaeology does for the Bible it provides us with information to help construct the historical framework of the Bible events. Uh, there, there is, there's much that archaeology has helped us to understand that we previously didn't necessarily understand uh, in terms of uh, the gaps that, that are there in the Bible, especially when it comes to cultural practices, um, the language of the Bible, etc., etc., it helps, helps us to explain some of those cultural practices. It provides us also with a political framework. And this is what I told you earlier on about my simplistic way of growing up. I thought Israel was the nation in the world. I thought Israel was the world. But when you start studying uh, the history and, and especially archaeology, you begin to realize that there, there were many other things happening around Israel. In fact, more important things than than just focusing on Israel, that Israel was really a tiny little soccer ball uh, in the larger scheme of things, and were, uh, Israel was kicked around by all of these other major empires around, from Egypt in the south to Assyria and Babylonia in the north, north, uh, north uh, east. It also confirms some biblical information. I want to emphasize the word some. Not every single thing in the Bible can be confirmed, at least yet. And so we need to be very clear on that. There's much in the Bible that is unknown. There are many things um, that archaeology cannot do for us. Uh, it is a limited science, but it, it provides us with wonderful information and confirmation. But the fact is that in some cases, archaeology may have created even more questions. And I'll give you a quick example of that. The city of Jericho was destroyed when Joshua and the people of Israel moved into the land of Canaan. Now, when scientists now, and archaeologists, and people who know a lot more than, than I do, uh, when they start studying the material around the archaeological digs in, in, in Jericho, they have uncovered some foundations, and it is believed that Jericho is either the oldest or one of the oldest cities in the world, where people started dwelling together, rather, on, on farms and so on. Um, but archaeology has also raised some issues because there were pillars discovered and when you start looking at the Exodus account and you put the dates and the facts together, there are certain things that don't necessarily match. Again, I want to remind you, we're talking about information that is 3,000 years old, more than 3,000 years old. 
and to try and piece it all together, science cannot do it all for us. And we need to be realistic as far as that is concerned. Archaeology cannot prove our faith. Archaeology cannot tell me God is good, or God is God, or God is my Savior. That is a faith statement, which I gather from the information, the historical information, the biblical information, and ultimately, and, the, and I believe, through the working of the Holy Spirit in my heart and my life, where He changed my life to believe in God, to accept Jesus as my Savior, and to receive the Holy Spirit, and to live in His power. That is by faith. And I, I, I don't need archaeology to prove my faith. It helps, but I don't need archaeology necessarily. There is a, um, a theory or a reality in archaeology that we need to also take note of, and that is called the fraction reality. Edwin Yamauchi, uh, who is quoted in Neil and Watson, the book that I mentioned at the end of your notes, explains the fraction reality. Just, just look at this and, and see if you can get your hands on it. He says that when it comes to archaeology, we only have a fraction of the evidence that survived in the ground. Put it differently. Only a fraction of the evidence survived in the ground. Now, state it differently or explained in this way. When a city is destroyed by an earthquake, uh, I mean, it's massive destruction. And whole houses and buildings do not survive. In fact, they all tumble and they crumble, most of them. And in the crumbling process, everything inside the house also crumbles. Now, that is left there over years. Maybe sand and dust and everything covers that. And then two, three thousand years later, we go and try and uncover. We're not uncovering whole houses and buildings and vases and, and libraries and that sort of thing because only a fraction of the evidence survived, whether it's a war or an earthquake or whatever destroyed that particular city. And then only a fraction of possible sites has been detected or discovered. There are certain sites that have not been discovered. They are there, but they haven't been discovered because they're covered um, with soil. And only a fraction of the possible sites has been excavated. There are many sites that we know about, but they haven't been excavated. For many reasons, um, in some European countries, modern cities are built on top of the rubble. Now, you don't go and break down um, the city hall in order to excavate what is underneath. You leave the city hall, maybe one day somewhere in the future, and it has actually happened in a few places where, um, I think, in, in one of the European cities, uh, um, um, I don't remember the details now, but, but they, were, they were actually uh, demolishing... Um, a bus station, and as they started digging for, to do the foundations, they discovered some ruins, and they stopped the whole process, and then they started excavating, and discovered an old Roman market uh, underneath. And so, only a fraction of the possible sites has been excavated. And only an, a fraction of any site has been excavated. So when there is a site, and it has been excavated, only a fraction of it, and then only a fraction of the excavated information has been examined. Now, when they start digging and they get all these pot shirts and things, they, um, they're all broken, or mostly broken. It's wonderful when they get a whole piece of stuff, whatever it is, or, or, or uh, item. It's wonderful when they get an article, when it's whole, but that is very, very seldom. Most of the things are actually broken. And then they need to excavate some more to try and piece it all together like a puzzle. And then only a fraction of the examined and published information applies to the Bible. As I said to you, archaeology is a broad science and is done in, in the whole world in, in many different places. And only when it comes to Israel and a little bit of, East, of Egypt and a couple of other places does archaeology actually help us to understand more about the Bible. When it comes to archaeological sites, some ancient ruins are above ground and can be assessed, accessed by anyone if you are legally allowed to do so. Uh, in Israel, for example, and even in South Africa, I'm sure it, it, it's the case. You don't just walk around and start digging somewhere and saying, I'm an archaeologist. You, you need permission from the authorities because what is under the ground belongs to the authorities, whoever they may be. And that is in particularly the case in Israel. You need the Israeli government and all the authorities and long red tape before you start digging anywhere. You just don't go and start digging. <clears throat> 
Others are partially covered and they need to be cleaned in order to get the ancient information. Most ruins are below ground level and only careful excavation can uncover the story. In other words, I don't go in there with a big shovel this size and just start digging because in the process I will do more damage than anything else. When you have seen some of the pictures of archaeological digs or sites, you will see that they do with brushes and little trolls and little things and, and they start uncovering. And when someone discovers something, the whole thing stops and they say, wait, and they, they start very slowly uh, to, to uncover uh, the remains. Ruins include, include cities, buildings, graves, dumps. Uh, the interpretation and the identification of any find is a complicated process. It is a highly technical and sophisticated science. It's not the kind of thing that uh, any Tom, Dick and Harry can go and, and do uh, to try and interpret, to date certain items, for example. Uh, it takes a very, very specialized uh, approach. Digging a till, um, that's the word that I mentioned to you earlier on. Um, many ancient cities have been built and rebuilt and rebuilt several times. Um, this, the Tel, Tel El Methuselah, which is Megiddo. If you go to Israel, you actually go and visit Megiddo. And Megiddo is, is a mound. It's a, it's a hill. And it has as many as 20 layers of civilization, even predating Solomon's time. When you go there, there are certain areas of Megiddo where you walk around and you will see some of the remains that date back to Solomon's time. Some of the... Um, uh, Places where he kept his horses, for example, those things have been uncovered and has been dated uh, to the time of Solomon. But as I said, you have these layers and archaeologists then slowly but surely try and uncover. Uh, rather than do the whole thing, they do, they'd rather dig a tunnel um, uh, vertically down. Archaeologists dig very carefully through each of those layers. Uh, tunneling from the top to the bottom and then trying to identify the different layers of civilization and they do it through uh, dating of the materials that they find whether it's potsherds or um, uh, human remains you don't necessarily find because they, they, they don't last that long. Some of the sample finds um, that are important for biblical history, um, archaeology has confirmed Shishak's war against Rehoboam that we find described in 1 Kings chapter 14, uh, previously not um, known except for in the Bible. The kingship of Omri and the power of Ahab. It's interesting when you go to the books of, of Kings that, and, and, and uh, Chronicles that Ahab plays a major role in the biblical history. But Omri is only mentioned in a couple of verses. But it's the reverse when you go to the archaeological evidence uh, where Omri actually uh, seems to be playing quite a, a, a prominent role uh, back in those days as the king of Samaria. The fall of Samaria, mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 18, uh, is also confirmed in the uh, Assyrian documents. And then there was a seal discovered not many, many years ago in Jerusalem that has the inscription, Belonging to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the scribe. And the interesting thing is that this is probably the scribe that was, was attached to Jeremiah, uh, mentioned in Jeremiah 32 and other places. Um, and I, I actually attended um, um, a, a, a session where someone showed this, they, they actually had the, the, the seal. Um, this particular person, who happens to be a Christian archaeologist, literally had tears in his eyes when he described how they discovered uh, this seal and how it confirmed the story of Jeremiah, previously not known except for uh, in the Bible itself. The list of relevant topics is interesting but long. Um, I, I cannot uh, go into all of that. A few other things. Uh, the most important finds that we have uh, are archives. More than a dozen major archives, mostly royal archives where a king described his story and his history and scribes around him. We have evidence beyond the Bible, or in the Bible, that beyond the Bible there were other books. When you go to Chronicles and Kings, both of them refer to um, literature or material that they have used in putting together their documents. And so scribes were a normal practice. They were attached to the, royal, uh, to the royalty or to the, uh, to the palace, and they described all the events 
uh, of the king. When he, when he was in a war, they would describe how he came back and conquered everything. When, when he didn't conquer, they didn't describe it. They left it out. They only described the, the victories. But in the ancient Near East, there is Ebla, and the, uh, which dates to the third millennium northern Syria. And there are thousands of clay tablets providing some important historical information about the larger scheme of things, not necessarily about Israel. The Nudzi tablets or archives, these are personal archives that date from about 1500 to 1350 BC. And it sheds light on family structures in the patriarchal um, era. The, the fact that Abraham, for example, had a, a slave of, Han, of his wife, uh, what was her name? Sarah, Sarah, he, Sarah had, and Sarah couldn't have children, so she offered Abraham her slave, and Abraham then had a child with her. That is described in these tablets uh, as general practice in those days. So nobody would have frowned, nobody would have said, "Well, you know, this is unacceptable. You don't do it." It was normal practice uh, in those days. Monuments and inscriptions, um, the Misha. Uh, inscriptions and monuments from the Moabite king, which is close to Israel, the Sennacherib prism, which is, dates from Isaiah's time, the Cyrus cylinder, which dates from 538, uh, which confirms the exile and the return of the exiles from, uh, from Babylon at the time. There's also non-biblical literature. Um, some of the examples, uh, we have talked about the Apocrypha, the book of 1st Maccabees describes for us the history of Israel from 175 to 135. Uh, we would not have known much of the history if it wasn't for 1st uh, Maccabees. And then the works of Josephus, and they have been published. Uh, in fact, I'm sitting with some of his volumes um, on my shelf. Uh, but Josephus uh, was a, a Jew, also known as, as uh, Yosef ben Matitayu, and he became known in his capacity as a Roman citizen. Uh, and his name then, uh, his Roman name was Titus Flavius uh, Josephus. And he was a first century Jewish historian and apologist of priestly and royal ancestry who survived and recorded the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so he described that event. He also mentions Jesus. He mentions the Christian church, the early church. His works give us uh, an important insight into first century Judaism, the way they thought, some of the thought patterns, the, the Sadducees, the, Sar the Pharisees and those, that, that we wouldn't have known because in the New Testament, we only, when we arrive in the New Testament, you suddenly have the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They're not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. So somewhere in the 400 years between the two Testaments, those groups of people came into existence or those parties came into existence. And Josephus helps us to put some of that in perspective, but not all of it, because a lot of that is still clouded in mystery. By way of conclusion, and just before we take a break, we have enough evidence from the Bible itself that we can, number one, put together a very solid, reliable overview of the history of Bible events. We can say with confidence that the Bible is trustworthy in its description of God and his dealings with Israel and the Christian church. That much we can say from the Bible. And then much of what is found in the Bible has been and can be proved from both archaeological discoveries as well as extra-biblical literature. But not everything. We need to be realistic uh, about that as well. Now let's take a break and um, then we'll talk about the history of Israel. I'm going to uh, move back and forth to the whiteboard. I want to explain to you something about the timeline. Uh, I have discovered over the years, and even, even uh, being at a theological institution, I've discovered that, that many people come with uh, a bit of a vague idea of how a timeline, especially before Christ, how it, how it actually works. The year count starts with the year zero, which is fairly obvious. I think that should be obvious. So we, we are now, if you go this way, we are in the year 2011, 2011. So when you calculate that way, you start with one, two, three, four, uh, a thousand, two thousand, and so it goes on. So theoretically speaking, that, that's the year zero. Now it's like maths, when you, when you do plus one and then minus one, you start counting backwards and you start with one and two and three and you go all the way to 1000 BC and all the way back from there. 
And that's essentially how the timeline works. So when we start talking about uh, 600 BC, um, you're on this side of the timeline, the BC side of the timeline, and then suddenly I mention uh, 550. Now, you work backwards from there. And that, that's just to make it very clear uh, that all of us are, uh, are on the same page. The abbreviation BC is short for before Christ, and AD stands for Anno Domini, which means, um, or is the Latin for the year of our Lord. And so AD has come to mean that. So when I refer to a date, I would talk about um, Abraham, and in a moment we'll talk about Abraham, who lived about 2,000 years BC. So anything before the zero is BC. And then our history for the New Testament finishes um, the year 100, but this is AD and this is BC. It has become customary in modern usage, especially in non-Christian circles, to talk about BCE. You may actually see that reference on an ongoing basis. And that stands for before the common era. And that is because in our reference BC and AD, there is a very clear reference to Jesus Christ. Because he is the starting of our timeline, uh, our Western way of looking at the calendar. And so when you're not a Christian and you're a Jew or someone else uh, or, or an atheist or whatever, you don't necessarily want to recognize Christ. And so you would then talk about BCE, before the common era. And then also CE, meaning the common era. So we're now in 2011 CE, the common era. Uh, most Christians and most people in the Western world don't really mind that, so they will talk about AD rather than uh, CE. But that's just to make that very clear. When you read certain documents, they will refer to BCE instead of BC. References often made to a century BC. And... Um, in the first century BC and the second century BC, this is a, also a very, very important little concept that you need to try and get under the belt. Now, when you, when you start with nil and you go backwards, then in the first hundred years, if this is a hundred, you're talking about the first century BC. So anything from a hundred to zero, you talk about the first century BC. If you talk about a hundred and fifty, BC, you talk about the second century, the middle of the second century BC. So it can be extremely confusing. In fact, it confused me for many years to try and understand. When I talk about the eighth century BC prophets, for example, then you start, you talk about those who lived in the 700 and whatever it is. Um, and so, eighth century, but it's 722 when Samaria fall, for example. So those things may confuse you tremendously unless you really have a bit of a grip uh, on that. So just to make sure that you understand that. Now, when it comes to our Christian year count, the Christian calendar, for the most um, part used in the, in the world that we know, in, um, it's the most common one used in the world today, is only one of a few ways in which the calendar can be expressed. There is a Chinese calendar, there is a Jewish one, and the Jews really start whenever they believe the creation started. So they're in the 5,000 somewhere. Uh, that's their year count if they, if they mention the date today or the year today. Uh, the Christian dating system was devised in 525 AD, in other words, in our era, and only found widespread use from the 8th century onwards, um, that is, in the 700s onwards, and as late as the 15th century in some of the European countries. Now, here's an interesting theoretical question, and I want your response on that. Is there a year nil? Anybody? Is there a year nil? Well, theoretically, no. Actually, there isn't. I mean, that's just when somewhere the calendar started, but the next day was already into the first year. So that would be year number one. So there is actually no year zero. Here's another question. What happened in the year zero? If there is a year zero, and I will refer to that, but theoretically speaking, the, practically speaking, there is no year zero. But what, what supposedly happened in the year zero? Jesus was born. Okay. Well, that is the way in 525 that the calculation was made. But an error crept in, in the calculation. <laughs> 
And as we go on, and next week, I'll talk more about that. But Jesus, if this is the year zero, and I'll just operate on the year zero uh, on the board on this one, Jesus was born roughly 4 BC. Now, that's a bit ironical. We say Jesus was born four years before Christ. <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's an error, and as I'll point out next week, we know it because Herod the Great under whose reign Jesus was born, died in the year 4 B.C. So Jesus was born somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C. And simply a calculation error, uh, not making any difference to the fact that he was born. Describing history is always a perspective. I've shared this with you before, so I'm not going to elaborate. But the main purpose of our overview of history in this lecture is to put the whole of the Bible history in, in historical perspective. I'm going to share with you some dates and events as we go through that. And I'm, I only have time to mention the major dates as we go along. And those major dates are going to become important. And if you're a good student and you registered for the certificate of completion and you are going to write the exam, you will put that in your mind right now because the dates are going to be in the test or in the exam later on. I also need to mention to you that biblical scholars don't always agree on all of the dates. Uh, one of the things I'll point out in a moment is that the date of the Exodus has different supporters. Uh, it can be either 1450 or 1250 BC, roughly. And, and give and take, and, and again, we're talking 4,000 years, 3,000 years, 2,000 years ago. And so when we start talking about a date, then uh, it may not always be exactly 100%. But the closer we get, the, the further we move on the timeline, the more secure we are in the actual dates because they are supported with all sorts of different evidence. I'll tell you a little story about a man who worked in a museum um, and there were dinosaur uh, carcasses uh, or whatever you call them, bones or whatever in this museum. And uh, he was taking a party around and he said, um, this particular dinosaur is three million and six years old. And so one of the people said, uh, what do you, do, why, why three million and six? He said, well, when I started working here six years ago, they told me it's three million years old. <laughs> and I think it proves the point of, of how unsure we sometimes need to be about being too precise about the actual year and the date. So when we start talking about these dates, in some cases, give and take a year, two years, five years, ten years, and in some cases, depending on how people, scientists or uh, scholars, interpret the evidence available to them, the Exodus event actually differs by 200 years in terms of their interpretation. I go for the later date personally, roughly 1250, um, but I'll tell you about that in a moment. Now, what happened before Abraham? Um, <laughs> We, we can, with a certain amount of certainty, say that Abraham was called by God roughly 2,000 years B.C. What happened before him? Well, that is an open debate. The first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis describe the events of the creation. When did that happen? Was it, was it 6,000 years ago, or was it 3 million, was it 10 million, was it 100 billion years ago? Well, the Bible doesn't actually say. However, people have arguments about that, and they will say, no, when you work your way backwards from the generations, and you add up the number of years, and the overlaps, and everything else, and the fact that Genesis 1 talks about a day which is supposed to be a 24-hour day, and another person will put up his hand and say, was it really a 24-hour day, or was it, was it an, an era which may have been millions of years? Now, I'm not going to get into that debate, because it's not part of our debate, unfortunately. It is one that people, and, and you can read up on that, and, and people hold very strong views about that. And I'm not talking about a debate between Christians and non-Christians. I'm talking about a debate among Christians. Now, I'm not even talking about the non-Christians. They have all sorts of other ideas, perhaps. But even Christians disagree on that. But the fact of the matter is, in 11 chapters, we are told that God created the universe. He created Adam and Eve. And whether that's one man, one woman, or humankind, again, people have different views on that. Um, he talks about, or those chapters talk, tell us about Noah in chapter 6 and the flood, and then how from that point on, uh, the Tower of Babel and, and the nation spread around the world. And then in chapter 12, the story about Abraham starts. The period before 2000 BC is referred to as prehistory prehistory, 
for the very reason that we cannot date anything precisely. We have no evidence. Uh, we, we, we don't have any extra-biblical, archaeological, or any other evidence to tell us when it happened and how it happened and so on. So we're dependent on those 11 chapters in the Bible um, from a biblical point of view to inform us about what happened up to the point of Abraham. And even then, we have major mysteries that we cannot solve. Uh, how did Abraham know God? How did he know how did he recognize God's voice when God spoke to him? Because according to Joshua, he and the people in, in where he lived in Ur of the Chaldeans, they served other gods. And so, did Abraham serve another god or didn't he? Well, we actually don't know. We know from the biblical account that God came, called Abraham, Abraham put his faith in God and he followed God. That's as much as we know. And we, need, we therefore need to stick with what we do know. The other incidents is like during the Exodus. There is the prophet Balaam. Now again, I, I'm kind of wondering, where does this guy come from? Uh, he lives out there. He knows God. God speaks to him. He's called in to come and, um, uh, and curse Israel. And where does he come from? How does he even know God? Because did, did God not only work with Jacob and Joseph and Egypt and so on? Uh, or, or in Egypt and then the Exodus? Well, it seems like there's a bit of a bigger picture that is not exactly told in the Bible to us because it doesn't necessarily help us to, uh, in, in our understanding of, of the history. Well, I wish we had the information, but we simply don't have that sort of information. But the purpose of the author of Genesis in the beginning is to set the scene because he's heading somewhere. He's heading towards Abraham and Abraham's descendants, who ultimately will form the nation of Israel. That is why he even tells us the story about creation. It's not so much about the prehistory, but it's about moving with the story. The story is about Israel and how God called and formed Israel into being. Some archaeological discoveries date as far back as 4,500 BC, and I'm not talking about uh, the... Uh, rock formations and fossils and all those kind of things that, that scientists uh, try and decipher. I'm, I'm purely talking about archaeological, historical evidence uh, pointing to some historical events. And so that takes us all the way back even 2,000 years or, or more before we date uh, Abraham. But that's clouded in mystery for us. Uh, let me show you a map of Mesopotamia because this is where the focus of our study is going to take us in the next while, to, uh, in, in this lecture and then also uh, next week as well. Um, if you look at this map, and um, where I'm pointing right now, that, that's Jerusalem um, and the Dead Sea right there and the Sea of Galilee and that little area over there is where the events in the Bible really took place. Ur of the Chaldeans, and it's a massive big area. This is modern day um, Iraq, um, and, and so this is where Abraham was called from. This is a desert area, so people never, never traveled east to west straight. They traveled along the rivers. You can see some of the rivers. That's the Euphrates River right there. And they traveled all the way up and then down. And this is the route that people traveled in those days because they couldn't get across the, the Sinai Desert or the Syrian Desert rather the Arabian Desert. So Abraham was called from here. He went a little bit north. He stayed there for a little while, and from there he moved down. He traveled around. They never bought much. And then eventually Joseph and then Jacob following him, they went into Egypt, which is down, down over there. And so this is where the events take place. Now when you look at even at that map, is what I said to you before, Israel really forms a very tiny little space even in the ancient Middle East and in the modern East as well, Middle East. Just to um, fill you in, in terms of modern day, uh, a map uh, as modern as we can get, this is Israel. Israel now reaches down uh, to the, the Red Sea right there. Uh, that little section there is modern day Israel. Jordan across the Jordan River on that side, quite a large country. And then of course Egypt here. Syria, uh, Saudi Arabia, and this is Iraq over here. So that just puts it in, in modern perspective for you. From Abraham to Moses, this era is generally referred to as the time of the patriarchs. The word comes from the male head, the, the father figure in the family, and we talk about the patriarchs, and we include Abraham, 
and Isaac and Jacob, uh, especially in, in that. And then Joseph, one of the sons of, of Jacob, in, ends up uh, in the country of Egypt. The approximate date, as I shared with you before, is for Abraham is 2,000, and it's a rough figure. It can be 50, 100 years, 200 years, one way or the other. But this is very difficult to prove because we simply just don't have more precise information about Abraham. Joseph, by the time Joseph comes onto the scene, it can be about 750 or about 1700, 1750, when Joseph goes to Egypt. Um, and after uh, becoming the second in charge and uh, with the drought threatening the whole region, his brothers come and they, they buy some wheat from him. Um, and then uh, the story ends with Jacob also coming into the land of Egypt. And that's more or less where the book of Genesis ends. The early Hebrews or Israelites or whatever name you want to use for them at this particular time spend roughly 400 years, according to the Bible, in Egypt. So if you do a bit of a calculation, it is somewhere between 1400 to 1300. That the Exodus, that Moses arrives on the scene. The Exodus, <clears throat> there are two possible dates for this. I mentioned this before, either 1450, uh, which is a more conservative view, uh, but in my personal opinion, I don't think the evidence supports that uh, because that would put Israel for a very long period of time in the land of Canaan before Samuel and, and, and Saul and David, and we'll get to them in a moment. I personally think the Exodus is a bit later, like about 1200, 1250 or so. And you'll see we're counting down as we move down the timeline, about 1250. We have detailed knowledge of this particular era in the ancient Middle East from the documents in Egypt. Egypt had a, a very extensive record of their own pharaohs and the kings. And it's, it's well described, detailed description, and it goes all the way to 1100 uh, BC. Um, and so that coincides, however... The Exodus is not mentioned by the Egyptians. Now, being a large, massive event, such as dominated the nation of Israel and the Old Testament from that point on, it is quite interesting that it is not mentioned by any extra-biblical materials. There, there may be a few reasons for that. Uh, archaeologically speaking, the nation of Israel moved out of Egypt. Uh, they were not necessarily the nation in a coherent form yet. They were loose families connected to each other. They moved out. There's even evidence in the Bible that some Egyptians joined them in moving with them. But as they moved through the Sinai Desert and around Mount Sinai especially, they, they are being formed into a nation, given the law, and slowly but surely the concept of we are God's nation starts to develop uh, among them. Um, so that's one reason why the Exodus may not be mentioned elsewhere. And the second reason is archaeologically there is no evidence because they were intense. They never built a building. And so if some of the physical cities, I mean the, the, the brick and mortar cities, didn't even survive properly, let alone people uh, running around the desert for 40 years, they were living in tents. So there is no archaeological evidence. Uh, there is a, an email that floats around at the moment with... Um, a picture, a satellite picture of the Red Sea where uh, there, there may be an underwater uh, coral reef or bridge or whatever you want to call it, which could be the place where the Israelites actually crossed the Red Sea. And they have discovered, uh, according to this email and, and the pictures, it's a PowerPoint sort of presentation, they've discovered some of the, the, the wheels of the chariots um, fossilized uh, under, underwater where people, divers, have gone down and taken pictures of that. I was not able to verify that uh, kind of information, but it, it could just be true um, that, that it's there. But, but essentially, Israel was traveling around, living in tents, so they didn't build any buildings, and they didn't write many uh, documents to leave behind for us. And then, the Egyptians. Obviously, for them, this was a loss. And so they lost um, a major part of their existence at the time, because they had slaves who built cities for them, that can be proved. It's mentioned in the Bible. And the Israelites actually built cities for them. And so when the Israelites moved lock, stock and barrel in Moss, then the Egyptians were very disappointed. In fact, pursued them even to get them back. But they lost it and many of them drowned in the Red Sea according to the biblical account. 
Now, do you go back home and describe all of this, or do you just leave it rather a secret and say, we're not going to describe our losses? Which is exactly probably why they never referred to the Exodus, because for them it was a loss. It wasn't a war that they won. But the Egyptian texts do talk about Israel, and that can be dated 1230, and that is post the Exodus or around uh, the people maybe moving around the desert or so. There is mention, the word Israel is mentioned in the Egyptian accounts. The Pharaoh during the time of the Exodus could have been Tutmosis, uh, the second or the third. For the earlier date, that would be the 1400 date. Uh, if you opt for the 1250 date, then it would be Rameses the second or Rameses the Great, um, and sometimes simply spelled Ram Ramses. Um, and, and that he would have been the Pharaoh at that particular time. Then we move on to Joshua and Judges. After 40 years in the desert, uh, the conquest of the land takes place as early as 1400, where, again, it depends on how you interpret the evidence, uh, but no later than 1200. 1200 would be the time, uh, the latest possible time, uh, that the, the Israelites conquered the land. So in 1200, we talk about the conquest of the land of Canaan. It took more than a few generations to do so, uh, that's very clear from the book of Joshua. The first part of Joshua is a very exciting description of one war upon the other and how they conquered the land. The, the latter part of Joshua is just uh, the division of the land. It's not very exciting material. Um, but they invaded the land, but it's very clear, even all the way up to David, that they didn't conquer every single little bit in every nation or every group in the land. What they found in Israel, or in Canaan at the time, was not one unified nation that needed to be taken in a war. In fact, we, we talk about city-states. And every city, like Jericho, had their own king. And the people in the city and around the city then paid homage to this particular king. And so Joshua was able at the time to take city by city. Then we are told in Joshua that some of the cities, the kings, they called kings, came together and fought against Joshua, and obviously, uh, with the help of God, Joshua conquered them as well. But they didn't demolish everything. That's very clear from both Joshua, as well as when you go to the book of Judges. Um, and as late as David, David had to take the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites. Now, we're talking 200 years later. And so, the Israelites still didn't have the city of Jerusalem conquered. So there's evidence that it took several generations for the Israelites to really properly settle in the land. The book of Judges describes a period of some 200 years, extremely uncertain settling in the land of Canaan. And some of the stories and Judges uh, that you really need an 18-age restriction. They are terrible. I mean, one, one particular story uh, is just horrific. It tells about a man, a priest who traveled a bit, and he had a concubine with him. Uh, and as he traveled, he turned off to go and sleep overnight. He didn't have a place to sleep, but a man invited him in. Um, and, and similar to that of Gomor uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, the, the men in the city came and knocked on the door, Israelite city, came and knocked on the door and said, let, let this man come out, this visitor, we want to have sex with him. And um, the old man said no, and he said, and then the young man took his concubine, um, it's like a bayfro in Afrikaans, uh, and, and put her outside, and they went um, and, and demolished her that evening. The next morning, she lies on the doorpost, and she's dead. The man goes home. He cuts her, the body, in 12 pieces, sends it around the, the country, and says, this is what that particular city did to us. So the people rally together. They go to the city, attack it, and just about demolish the city because of the evil that they have done. That's the kind of story you find in the book of Judges. It's a chaotic story. It's a chaotic scene and scenario. In, uh, during the time of the judges, which is why God seems to be working through individuals, but it's not consolidated. It's Samson, but it seems to be localized. And then it's um, um, one of the other uh, uh, judges, or Deborah, uh, and, but it's all localized and it's different enemies that are attacking them. So it's a, it's a time of, of unsettledness, it's a time of chaos in the land of Israel. It is during this time that the Philistines, and you may have wondered about the Philistines, that they actually came into the country from the ocean side. Modern day Gaza is roughly where the Philistines settled at the same time that the Jews came in from the eastern side. And so these two nations uh, came together, uh, or rather they came at the same time. 
and settled in the land of Canaan. And for the next number of years, for about a hundred years or more, the Philistines were the major opponents of the Israelites until eventually Saul and then David finally uh, subdued them or subjected them. They are called the Sea Peoples or the Sea People. They were associated with the, the, uh, the island of Crete as far as we can determine. But there's a lot of mystery behind uh, the Philistines. They got into their boats and they went down to Egypt. They tried to take Egypt. They couldn't. And they turned around on their, their ships and they then came into the land on, on the coast um, of the Mediterranean and settled in the land of Canaan as well. And then we talk about the United Monarchy. During the time, uh, the end of the, the period of the Judges, roughly about 100, uh, uh, sorry, 1050, 1050, Samuel comes onto the scene and um, he is the last of the Judges and he is the one who then appoints Saul as the first king over Israel. Saul dies about 1000 BC and David becomes the king of Israel. And initially, for about seven, seven and a half years, he reigned in Hebron, which is in the south. But then, um, it seems like the tension between north and south was already there from who knows when and why. But there was tension between the northern tribes and the southern tribes. The southern tribes primarily made up of Judah and Benjamin. You read through the book of Joshua, you see how the land has been divided. We don't have time to go into that uh, now. But David, after he's appointed king, he is able to consolidate the nation. And by negotiation and reappointing of certain generals and making some political, wise political moves, he actually consolidates the nation of Israel, both Judah and Israel in the north, and they become one nation under David. And David was a was a, a wonderful a, a strategist, a general, knew how to fight a, a war, and he subdued many of the nations around and established a mini-empire for Israel at that particular time. It was during that time, after seven years in Hebron, that he conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites, took it over, and made it the capital, and ever since it's been the capital city, always regarded as the capital city uh, of Israel. Solomon became king in 960. So David becomes king in 1000. And by 960, Solomon becomes the king. And he inherits a wonderful empire, mini empire, which included many of the nations around, the Moabites and the, uh, the Philistines um, and several of the others, were Edomites. They were all included in this, uh, in this uh, uh, empire of Solomon. But when Solomon died in 922, his son Rehoboam inherited a king kingdom that was heavily taxed. Uh, Solomon was a rich person. Some of his riches literally came through taxes. Uh, that's not a story that is unknown to us. Um, but he uh, collected heavy taxes and the people complained. They said, we want relief. His son uh, consulted some of the older wise people. They told him, give in. But he didn't listen to them. He consulted his friends. And the friends said to him, uh, just, just take a hard stand, give it to them, show them, you, you're a boss. And at that particular time, there was another man by the name of Jeroboam. He was already opposed to Solomon, but he fled the country. And when he heard that Solomon was dead, he came back into the country and he took the tribes in the north with him and became the first king of the northern kingdom. And from that point on, we are talking about two different kingdoms, the northern kingdom and also the southern kingdom. A kingdom. And in a certain sense, we, we, uh, from 922, we're talking about two different lines. Um, a northern kingdom that was known as Israel. And don't be confused. You need to read the context of the Bible because oftentimes, especially in the prophets, when there's reference to Israel, it doesn't mean the whole of Israel. It means Israel in the north, the northern kingdom. Also known by another name, Ephraim, which is one of the sons of Joseph and also sometimes and often referred to by the capital city, Samaria, which wasn't initially the capital city, but eventually uh, one of the kings bought the land and built the, the city of Samaria. The southern kingdom contained, um, remained w uh, with Jerusalem as the capital, and Rehoboam then reigned, and from that point on we have kings in the line of David, always ruling and reigning in the southern kingdom.
Um, in the north, they had a whole range of different kings. And when we do the Old Testament um, study and we get to the books of Kings and Chronicles, then we actually line them all up and we look at every single one of those kings uh, in a brief way. But from this time, the history of Israel and Judah follows two co concurrent timelines. And the interesting thing is when you read through Kings and Chronicles, you actually read uh, in the so manyth year of the king of the south, you know, whoever it is, jo Josiah or whoever, then so-and-so became the king of the north, of Israel. So from that point on, it's, it's referred to as Israel and Judah. Israel and Judah. And the story is told jumping up and down from the one uh, to the other. And that's the way you need to read it. Now, just jumping quickly forward to the prophetic books. The, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all of those, all of them, you need to read against this background of a divided kingdom. Divided kingdom to the fall of Samaria and then ultimately the fall of Jerusalem. And I'm running out of space on this board in terms of my, of my timeline. The end of the northern kingdom. Do you remember that at this same time there was another world? In fact, there was the world around Israel. We read it from an Israelite perspective or a biblical perspective right here. But in the meantime, we have timelines for... Assyria, for Babylonia. Uh, yes, there was Greece and the Romans and everybody else. They were there, but uh, maybe sometimes in embroiled form. But certainly the major powers at that time um, revolved around Egypt in the south, Assyria in the north for a long while. And during this particular time, or up to a certain point in time, 722 in the 8th century B.C., the Assyrians became, and it's the third new Assyrian Empire, uh, we, we refer to that. In 2 Kings chapter 17, it described how they came, they swept across the world, um, and, and their purpose always was to go to Egypt. Uh, Israel was, was a non-issue. Uh, they can walk over Israel. It was not, not even a problem for them. So they want to go to Egypt and conquer Egypt, and in that process, they just plop a few people here on the, on the way, uh, getting there, and they did exactly that with Samaria. Um, and so they conquer Samaria, they take the people into captivity, probably most of the top echelon, they bring in a, a number of other nations, and the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, never recovered, ever recovered. It has led to many, many arguments and, and speculations about the lost tribes of Israel. Many interesting stories about that. The Mormon church in the U.S. believe that they are the lost tribes of Israel. That's part of an official belief of the Mormon church. Um, there are also those who believe that, that um, England, Britain, British, and you can hear the word, it's a, it's a, uh, the word ish is, is people or people group, and there are those who believe that Britain or British people are the lost tribes of Israel. Of course, I believe it's a bunch of rubbish. But you won't believe this, or maybe you will, but there are actually white Afrikaners in South Africa who believe that they are the lost people, the lost <laughs> tribes of Israel. So maybe I'm special somehow or the other after all, but I'm not sure about that. But it has caused all sorts of speculation. My personal belief is by the time we reach um, the, the hundreds of years just before Jesus came and during the early church, uh, the Jews were scattered around the world. We talk about the, the sc uh, scattered nation. Uh, and I believe that they, they remain scattered all over the place. Some of them may have rejoined Judah eventually because the southern line continued for another little while. Assyria threatened Jerusalem at this time. But by God's grace and a miracle, the Assyrian king had to pack up and go home and was murdered on the way there. And the Assyrian capital was Nineveh, the city of Nineveh. That should ring a bell because that's where Jonah went and gave his uh, prophecies as well. The end of Judah uh, and the exile of Judah. In a series of battles, the Babylonians, um, and if you can picture the, the Mesopotamia, Assyria, Nineveh is in the north of that, that region I showed you earlier. And if you go down into Iraq, around about Ur and Babylon, so on, that's where the Bab Babylonians lived. And in a series of battles, they overthrew the Assyrian Empire, and of course now they inherit, because the Assyrians had this empire, they inherit the empire, but they needed to come and stand their authority on all, every other place. So again, they're heading towards Egypt. They want to go to Egypt to, to conquer Egypt. 
And in that process, they also subdue Judah. Um, and they do it almost by the way. And they do it in several different campaigns, starting about 608-609 uh, AD. So we're beyond that line, but just ignore this. There will be a bit of a break over here. But about 609, roughly, um, the Babylonians already started. In fact, by 612, the Babylonians destroy Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians. Their capital city was Babel, ba Babylon. And so from Babylon they, they uh, conquer and reign over this whole empire. During a series of campaigns in the late 7th and early 6th centuries, B.C., the Babylonians attacked and subjected Jerusalem, Judah, and the kings started paying taxes to the Babylonians. They, they had to, they had no choice. Some of them were actually already taken into captivity during that time. They do exactly the same in 597, when they come once again, 597. They come again and they again um, subject Judah because they were a little bit of an uprising and they take taxes with them and they take more people with them into captivity. And when there was another rebellion by the Jews, by the, by the kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, just got complete, completely fed up and he said, this is it. He went to Jerusalem, sieged, besieged the place, and in 586, he destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And we're talking about the first temple era. Solomon built the temple before 922, somewhere between 960 and 922. That temple was destroyed. Slowly but surely, some of the artifacts of the temple were taken with the Babylonians in the first few campaigns. But in 586, because they were just up to here, they said, this is it, and they destroyed Jerusalem completely and destroyed the temple. After that, and this is a, this is a picture of um, mini Jerusalem. Um, in Jerusalem, it's a, um, a city built with little Jerusalem uh, stone, actually. And the temple is a, is a beautiful a mini, as I said, as mini. I mean, I'm talking about this high. But it's a wonderful um, experience to see that and how they've reconstructed uh, Jerusalem around the time of Jesus, actually. Once again, the empire exchanged hands when the Babylonians were overthrown. Not in a, not in a massive war this time. In fact, the, the uh, Persians came, entered the city of Babylon and took it without, uh, figuratively speaking, firing a shot. Uh, they didn't have any uh, shots to fire in those days, but they, they just took the city overnight. And uh, the next day, the Persians were in control, and the first king of the Persians was a man by the name of Cyrus the Great. He is mentioned in the book of Isaiah and in several other places as well. And Cyrus, the first Persian ruler, allowed the exiles of all the nations to go back. And we have the evidence, archaeologically speaking, uh, that he gave permission not only to Israel, which is what the Bible says, uh, that he gave Israel permission or the Jews to go back, but he also gave permission. He followed a different philosophy. The previous philosophy was you go in, you take a country, you take the best people away, the, all of the rulers away, and you leave the land weak because the normal people of the land couldn't rule. And then you appoint your own people over them. But you have to take these captives and actually keep them in your own home country or capital city or whatever. Which is where Daniel comes in and Nehemiah and Esther and all those fit into that picture. They were people in exile. But when, when the Persians came into power, they followed a different rule. They said, we don't, we don't want you here necessarily, you can go home if you want to. But do remember that some people were now uh, a generation old and some people were born in captivity. That would have been someone like... Um, like Nehemiah, and I'll, I'll tell you in a moment when he lived. But um, those people were actually born in captivity, so they, um, they, they chose to stay in, in Babylon. They didn't go back to their country. The first of the Jewish exiles went back in 538, um, and this is the date over here. And I only have space for two more dates, so I'll, I'll give you two more dates. And they went home under Prince Zerubbabel, who sort of disappeared off the scene afterwards. We don't know what happened to him after that. And uh, these people rebuilt the altar. They started rebuilding the temple, but only completed in 515, 515. And from that point on, all the way to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, we talk about the second temple era. And this was a smallish kind of temple, 
um, not as elaborate as Solomon's, but when Herod the Great ruled, and more about that next week, he extended the temple and, and built a, a, a temple that was even bigger than Solomon's for the Jews, because he wanted to impress the Jews. And Nehemiah, who, whom I said was born in captivity, uh, had a passion to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And he came to Jerusalem in 400, 445. Uh, we know the date exactly because he tells us that he did so uh, in the whatever year of the king. And the counting of calendars in those days were done, was done according to the reign of the, of, of the ruler. So you, you always date yourself. I was born in the fifth year of the king's reign, that sort of thing. And so that's how we know exactly the date for uh, Nehemiah. Then followed a period of 400 years, which we refer to as the silent years. The Bible doesn't talk about it. Nehemiah is the last historical book in the Bible. Um, Malachi and a few others, Zechariah and so on, lived towards the end of the building of the temple. So that's about 500, 515 or so. After that, there is silence. Now, we have evidence of that, and I'll tell you the story next week when we talk about the, 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 the silent years or the intertestamental period. And then, of course, there's transition. The world of the Middle East saw several major changes in ownership uh, and power during that time, and, and I'll tell you that story next week, shifted from Alexander the Great to Egypt to Syria to Jewish independence, and then finally the Roman Empire, uh, which was the most successful empire probably ever, um, as far as I'm concerned, and it provided the immediate context for the birth of Jesus and, and his life, his death, and the start and the expansion of the early church happened as a result of the Roman Empire and during the reign of the uh, empire. Jesus was born when Herod the Great was uh, in power in Judea. He died in 4 BC, which is why we know that Jesus was born before that time. And when Herod the Great died, his kingdom, um, which is essentially Israel, as you look at Israel, was divided into three different parts, extending slightly beyond uh, the borders of Israel, um, but it included Judea. The, by now, we're not talking about a, one single country, we're talking about provinces. And when Jesus walked the earth, there were three provinces in Israel, Judea in the south, Samaria in the middle, and Galilee in the north. And so that's the scenario. And that's when you, when you go to the New Testament, you read about Galilee and Samaria and Judea. They were provinces, and each one had a governor. Uh, and, he, and the Romans, because they wanted to um, uh, sort of bring the Jews on board, they allowed uh, a Jew, they thought a Jew to rule over them. That was Herod. But the Jews hated Herod because Herod was a half Jew. He was half Edomite uh, as well. Jesus started his public ministry around 27, maybe 30. Uh, but he could have been 30, 33 when he started his ministry. Again, the dates are not exactly sure. And he died about three or four years later after public ministry. Um, and, and this would be Palestine in the time of Jesus, with Galilee in the north, the Sea of Galilee right there, Samaria stuck in the middle. Again, the Samaritans came onto the scene, whether they were the descendants of the Israelites, because Samaria was here in the north, um, around here and then the province of Judah, or Judea, uh, in the south. This was Edomia, uh, which is also mentioned um, in, in the Bible as well. The early, church, um, the early church expanded rapidly throughout the Roman Empire under the emperors Gaius Caligula. And by the way, the history of the Roman Empire is well documented, and you can, you can read up on that uh, with all of the different emperors, one after the other, how they did and who they were and how they came into power. All those things are wonderfully recorded for us. But during the times of Gaius, Caligula, Claudius, mentioned in the Bible, and Nero. Nero was the one responsible for putting Paul to death, according to tradition. Some Jews and half-Jews acted as co-regents. There is Herod, and this is confusing in the Bible because it mentions Herod when Jesus was born. He died in 4 BC, but it mentions another Herod when Jesus was crucified. Now that is Herod Agrippa, and uh, he goes by the name Agrippa, but he was uh, another Herod. So you don't, you, you, you don't want to be confused when you read your New Testament in this regard. Paul and his companions played a major role in the spreading of the gospel, and by the end of the first century AD, there was a well-established church network around the Middle East and Europe. It spread from 
Israel into Syria, into Asia Minor, all the way to Europe um, and around all the islands and down into Egypt uh, and the church spread like wildfire in those days. Israel in the first century AD, Jewish political life was dominated by the Roman Empire. At the time, the Jews' desire for independence led to two major Jewish revolts, revolts uh, during that time. 66, uh, roughly, leading up to the destruction and the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, under the commander Titus, came and literally demolished uh, Jerusalem. At, uh, by that time, the Jews were, were uh, the Romans were also fed up, like the Babylonians earlier on, and they destroyed the temple and Jerusalem. Um, they had more difficulties with the Jews, and the Jews then went into another uh, revolt in the in the second century. Um, and some of the zealots held out um, as early as well after the, the destruction of Jerusalem in 74 A.D. The Romans attacked the last stronghold of the Jews, which was on Masada. If you visit Israel, you go up to the mountain Masada. It's like, like Table Mountain type thing. You go up with a cable car. There were about 960 Jews, women and, and children including. And uh, by the time the Romans reached the top through a ramp that they built up uh, over months, uh, by the time they reached there that previous night, uh, according to the tradition, uh, all the Jews committed suicide. They killed one another and the last person... Uh, committed suicide. So the Romans, they didn't want to give the pleasure to the Romans to actually conquer them or to take them captive. Another revolt happened under a person by the name of Bar Kochba. Bar means son, so the son of Kochba, from about 131 to 135 AD. It resulted in the Romans, in this particular case, Emperor Hadrian, finally crushing the Jews and rebuilding Jerusalem and, and preventing the Jews from going back to Israel. They said, this is it, we're not going to allow here. They they did demolish the city, whatever was remained, they demolished it and then rebuilt it as a Roman city. Some of the remains of that are still there uh, today to see. And they renamed it. They named it uh, Aelia Capitolina because they didn't want any resemblance with the Jews or Jerusalem. By the, this time, the center of Christianity was well established outside of Palestine and so they, Christianity was no longer dependent on Jerusalem as a city. And then finally, as much more that I can say, and especially when it comes to the church and church history, I would encourage you to read up on, on the early church history and some other places. Uh, but the overall picture of the history is one of realizing that the Bible is really God's story, His story. History is His story. God is in control. And, and this is my encouragement to you tonight. When, when I look at history, the Bible history, I see God in control. And I'll tell you more about that next week, especially when we look at how God prepared the world for the coming of the Messiah. Uh, in the 400 years prior, and, and that's the beauty of and that's why I keep it for one single lecture. I want to tell you the story of the intertestamental period and how God prepared the world for the coming of Jesus and the spread of the early church. Now to do, please go over your notes again, the first 33 books, names of the books of the Bible for next week. And then um, try and memorize some of the most important dates, and I'll tell you which ones. Um, you're talking about this, the Exodus is an important date, Abraham is an important date, um, the start of the King Air era is 1050 uh, BC, um, Solomon and the division of the kingdom, 922, and there are a couple of other dates by the way, 931 is another possible date for Solomon's death, 722, the fall of, Jeru uh, the fall of Samaria, 586, the fall of, of Jerusalem. 445, the return of Nehemiah uh, to rebuild the wall of, of Jerusalem. Those are some of the uh, more important dates. Now next week we'll look at the history of Israel in those 400 years and then draw some conclusions from that. I'll see you next time and enjoy uh, your week.